chair is Martina, whose last name I'm going to mispronounce, Cassini. Um, and we're really pleased to have you here. And just to make sure you're in the right spot, this is cross-cutting issues and advancing research and development of new tools for TB. One, one thing I have to note is that unfortunately, Christian Leonhardt couldn't make it. So we have, we have kind of a gap in the schedule, which means we've told all of our speakers that they can speak a little bit more slowly. And we'll open up that up for questions as well. So we're hoping to have this be a, a very interactive section. Two plugs. So um, the first is that every two or so years, the Stop TB Partnership sponsors the gl global forum on TB vaccines. And this year, it's going to be happening in Delhi. And I think the dates are February 20 to 23. In fact, Jennifer Woolley is the chief organizer of this. You're all, if you have any interest in vaccines, it typically is a, just a terrific and very interactive meeting. So I would encourage you to come to that. And the second is that ARIS and the Stop TB Partnership and TBVI are all sponsoring a TB vaccine stakeholders reception tonight, which I hear is open. And it's from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Gave Room at the Westin. So you're welcome to come, and I think there'll be something to eat there, right? I mean, I'll <laughs> so that's enticement to come. And drinks. So, um, so I think with, with sort of out further ado, I think our first speaker is actually Hanif Esmail, who's both, he splits his time between Oxford and Cape Town, and has really done, I think, groundbreaking work in sort of really helping us to see kind of the, that, that there's nothing really latent about latent TB. And I think of some of his work has really been groundbreaking and really helping us to sort of develop, I think, a much more detailed understanding of what it means to be sort of subclinically or latently infected or have smoldering TB. So it's really a pleasure to have you here, and you're going to tell us about how new tools are going to help us advance the field. Thank you very much. Thanks for that very kind introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So it's a real shame that Christian isn't here to kind of give the, the overview to um, this session. And thank you for the title, which was really um, a very broad one, and, and I'm, I'm not going to cover all uh, scientific innovations and how they, that might contribute to the, uh, the fight towards TB. I'm going to focus a lot on some of the work I've been doing and, and contextualize that, and really think about um, what new diagnostic markers could really revolutionize the way that we um, think about TB and how some of those markers might be very helpful to, to vaccine developers and uh, to drug developers as well. Um, and also just to say uh, clearly, with it, it goes without question that um, optimizing the use of the current tools is, is clearly a, a major priority. And, uh, and certainly that, that's the um, approach that, uh, that we're planning to take over the initial phase of this um, uh, elimination phase for TB to optimize what we already know that we can do but I think there's also a great recognition that that's, in the long run, not going to be enough and that we are going to have to develop new ways of thinking about TB and new tools for uh, TB in order to truly achieve our elimination goals. And I don't know if there's is there a pointer on this. So I think um, at the outset, there'll be, it is useful to think about what sort of tools or what kind of approaches do we need to take if we really are truly going to achieve our goal of eliminating TB um, over the next 30 to 40 years. Um, and this is uh, work by uh, Chris Dye, um, who, who's been very kind of influential in the way that we think about this. Um, and just to kind of go through this slide, this is the baseline um, incidence of tuberculosis. And you can see that the, the, the rate that we're going, not a great um, dent is being made uh, in incidence, and the scale, as you notice, is a log scale. And so his... Um, thoughts about what we would need to do to, to make a big impact on, on TB incidence over, over the coming years were that, one, a vaccine which was able to prevent infection and to um, essentially turn the, the susceptible population into a resistant population would have clearly have a, a fairly uh, decent impact on uh, reducing incidence, as would very aggressively treating active tuberculosis, i.e. treating people incredibly early to m minimize or almost eliminate transmission um, uh, would have almost a similar effect to, to a pre-exposure uh, pre vaccine and similarly have a fairly decent effect on, on TB incidence uh, over this time frame. But the thing that would have the greatest single impact is tackling this reservoir of tuberculosis, a mass treatment of latent tuberculosis, which would essentially prevent 
or reactivation uh, uh, would have a considerable effect. And of course, combining these things together, i.e. treating the reservoir, but also aggressively um, case finding and managing active tuberculosis would really be what we would need to do if we were going to achieve um, elimination over this kind of 30 to 40 year period. So part of the question is, do we really have the tools to achieve this at the moment? And I, I would suggest that at the moment we, we don't really have the tools to achieve this. And I, and I guess there are some recent studies which have attempted fairly kind of bold interventions in communities with, with little effect. One might be the Tabella study where they aggressively case finder then complemented that with IPT in a, in a large scale admittedly in the mines which are a very unique situation showing very little impact on um, uh, incidents in that community and things like the Zamstar study which really tried to take active case finding and our current understanding of that uh, right into the community to see if that could impact on prevalence and incidents in communities with little impact as well. So clearly the types of approaches that we're using uh, at the moment have their limitations and need to be tweaked. And I think part of the issue is um, this very deeply entrenched way that we have to conceptualize um, TB which really comes from these fairly old, blunt and rusty tools that uh, developed, developed over a uh, hundred years ago, um, uh, TST and things like culture, and I'd su suggest that the kind of uh, innovations that we've had recently with things like iGRIS um, and, and GeneXpert are really sort of similar versions of the same thing. They're not really kind of major shifts in the way that we can think about TB. Um, so just thinking about um, TSC and IGRA, what we use to what we call diagnose lethal infect infection, it's very important to realize that this does not tell us whether an individual has viable organisms. It is a marker of an acquired immune response uh, to tuberculosis. And very critically, if you treat someone with either, for either latent or active disease, it does not revert to negative. So it re remains positive and is essentially a cum cumulative index of an individual's exposure. And if you go to settings uh, like Cape Town, some of the townships around Cape Town, about 75% of the adult population uh, will have a positive um, um, interferon gamma release assay or, or TST. In addition, they, they very poorly predict, um, both of them, um, whether or not individuals are going to develop active disease over a two, three year period. So both of them have predictive values in the region of one and a half to two and a half percent. So it's likely that there is a smaller population of people that have truly do have um, viable organisms, I truly do have a persistent infection. And if we could quantify that group, that would give us a much better handle on what the reservoir of latent infection was. And also we'd be, be able to dynamically map that over time as it reduces. Similarly, when it comes to active tuberculosis, a lot of our concepts um, of active tuberculosis start around symptoms. So a lot of this, the, the 10 million people that we have, um, uh, we pick up every year with disease, may be culture positive, um, but also we perceive them to have symptoms. And there are likely to be um, a number of people in the community that have reactivated and are in the early stages of disease, which may be um, asymptomatic, which might, may or may not be intermittently shed shedding organisms, and they might be considered to have incipient disease, i.e. it be relatively high risk of progression uh, to disease um, over the coming uh, months or year. And if we were able to develop a test for that, that would be incredibly valuable in active case finding, I identifying people even before they develop symptoms and identifying people on the basis of whether they have disease or not, not on, base on the basis of whether they have symptoms or not. And another thing in this sort of paradigm that I think we know about, but I don't think we talk about very much, and I think in part because it's an incredibly kind of challenging concept, is this idea that people that have, from sort of historical studies, and there have been a number of um, studies trying to kind of model this, um, people that have positive um, tuberculin skin tests historically were found to be at lower risk of developing disease following reinfection. So there's this idea that a subset of this group of, of people with um, positive, you know, um, immune sensitization with positive TSCs or IGRIS may in fact, in fact be protected from uh, reinfection. 
And if we could identify that group, that would amount to a correlative protection. That's really the kind of holy grail for vaccinologists to understand whether there is a type of acquired immune response which actually protects you from developing um, um, uh, reinfection and disease. So I'm going to focus on um, these kind of how we might think about approaching developing these new tests. I'm going to focus particularly on uh, developing tests for incipient disease because I think that's where a lot of the progress is being made and it's probably what the low-hanging fruit is and probably what we may achieve over the next um, five to ten years, whereas I think these may well be kind of uh, things that are further down, down the line. And how do we, just to think about how we might uh, approach developing a test for incipient TBs and certainly the, the approach that we took when we were kind of thinking about this, is what we want to do is identify people as soon as we can after the disease has reactivated, identify people in the earliest stages of their disease. Now, admittedly, after people reactivate whatever it is that kind of triggers that, and again, that's not, not a very well understood concept, some of them might self-heal and actually never progress to disease, but a, a number of them are going to, once they've, the reactivation has been initiated, disease might progress. And in this subclinical phase of disease, Symptom, people are often asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic. They may or may not be intimately culture positive. But the mainstay of um, diagnosis or screening uh, in terms of um, clinical practice has been with chest x-rays. So we all know that chest x-rays can be used to identify people prior to symptoms, prior to culture positivity, and that's really what the base of mass screening has been. However, chest x-ray has a number of limitations if you want to use it as a scientific tool. It's not very sensitive. Uh, and it's not very easy to quantify the amount of disease that you found on it. And there are far more sensitive imaging techniques which uh, are used clinically, um, which um, we might think about using as better tools to identify evidence of disease at its earlier stage. And we've been using uh, FTG PET-CT, so I'm going to describe the study that we've done utilising that, but just to kind of um, update you on, on this if you aren't sort of um, practising clinicians. Uh, FTG PET-CT is a, a fairly widely used uh, uh, imaging technique which essentially combines CT scanning, which provides very high-resolution cross-sectional imaging um, of, the, of the body here, along with, in this instance, FTG, FTG PET, which is a, um, a FTG being a glucose analog and a radio tracer, which essentially allows you to localized areas of metabolic activity within the body. And if you combine these two images, the CT scan with the FTG PET, you get a very detailed anatomy, but also um, um, uh, localized areas of metabolic activity within the body. And it's clearly not a specific tool for tuberculosis, uh, so it, but it can be used in certain contexts. But in the context of tuberculosis, what the metabolic activity relates to is uptake by macrophages and, and neutrophils. So we undertook the study um, fairly recently um, uh, in, in Cape Town in, uh, in a township called Kailiche, about 25, 30 kilometers outside of Cape Town. And um, we identified, in this really sort of a proof of concept study that it was, but we've gone into other things, we identified 35 HIV-infected um, individuals that were ART naive that had fairly high CD4 counts, so CD4 count median of about 500, all of them over 350, that had latent tuberculosis by the current definition. They were um, quantiferon positive, they were asymptomatic, they had a chest x-ray performed uh, with no evidence of active um, tuberculosis read by two individual uh, uh, clinicians. Um, they had two sputum cultures and they were observed for a six week period while the cultures were cooking to ensure that they remained um, culture negative, and at the end of six weeks, we had negative cultures. So to all intents and purposes, these people had latent TB, and in this context, they would have technically been um, eligible for IPT. So what we did prior to um, initiating them on IPT was to do a PET scan, to specifically flo uh, uh, focusing on the, on the lungs to look for evidence of um, early disease, uh, initiated them on treatment, and repeated the scan at the end, and then uh, took a whole load of samples um, in order to facilitate uh, later biomarker discovery. And what we found in these individuals that you know, were essentially um, supposed to be latent with um, and eligible for IPT, 
was that a number of them had evidence of early disease activity on their, or uh, consistent with early disease activity on their scan. So these were all fused PET-CT images taken in a coronal section, so kind of sliced um, through. This is the right lung, this is the left lung. And these are four separate individuals that just highlight um, lesions, which are not easy to see at this scale, um, within the right upper lobe. Uh, you can see these individuals slightly larger. Um, and this, the, the yellow and orange um, colouring shows you the metabolic activity as uh, defined by the, um, the PET-CT. Um, and what we also saw in these, all of these individuals, so it was an exclusion criteria to have previous TB. So none of these people have had previous TB treatment or history of TB. But we also saw evidence of scarring and fibrosis within the lungs. Here you can see that within uh, the left upper lobe here. This has got sort of areas of calcification as, uh, there as well and some fibrocystic changes there. All suggesting these individuals might have reactivated and then uh, perhaps um, controlled infection. So we took all of these images and systematically classified the, uh, the lesions that we found and went back to the um, autopsy literature to try and understand what these kind of patterns of abnormalities were that we were seeing and classified these 35 individuals into 25 that we thought had no evidence of subclinical pathology. Um, so they either had essentially normal lungs or they had, these are basically all the lesions projected onto a single uh, x-ray almost just for, just for visualization. Or they had um, uh, lesions um, within the lungs which were fairly small with no evidence of activity, often calcified, often at the peripheral edges of the lungs that we presume might be consistent with something like a GOM focus. And 10 individuals that did have evidence of um, uh, disease activity within the lungs, either, so the majority of them, either with scars or infiltrates. And if you, were, if you had um, scars on your lungs, you were significantly more likely to have infiltrates. So we kind of combined them together into one group. Uh, and a single individual that essentially had multiple lesions throughout the lungs, which were kind of very fluffy around the edges, uh, suggestive of um, active nodules or a kind of millery pattern disease. So we classified people into these uh, groups, 10 with subclinical pathology and 25 without. And, and we then went on to show that if you had the subclinical pathology, you were significantly more likely to either symptomatically or to symptomatically pro to progress along with microbiolog microbiological or radiographic progression and uh, required initiation of standard TB therapy. So it's all well and good to phenotype that. No one's suggesting that PET-CT is going to be a very valuable tool in the elimination of uh, tuberculosis. But what it does do is allows us to phenotype disease, which we can then utilize for biomarker discovery. And this is exactly the approach that we took. And one of the things that we focused on was, um, was on whole blood transcriptomics. So this has been a fairly sort of recently uh, in the TB field, been quite an exciting development. Uh, but essentially what, what it involves is uh, taking blood. Uh, the, the RNA is essentially freeze as soon as you, you take it. You can extract the RNA and then quantify the amount of uh, messenger RNA in the sample, either using microarray-based technologies or RNA sequencing. But essentially what that is giving you a, a, uh, some information about is what the white blood cells in blood are switched on, have, have switched on in terms of gene expression, and essentially gives you a, a global sense of the, the host response to a particular disease. So it gives you, a, in, in a sense, a disease signature. And the sort of seminal work on that was published in Nature in 2010 by Anna Garris group. But since that time, there's been multiple studies of, of this nature trying to demonstrate whether there is a gene expression profile or transcriptional signature for um, active tuberculosis. And what is very interesting and satisfying about a lot of these studies is that they're incredibly consistent. And so there's been an, a, a couple of fairly decent meta-analyses of, of all these now probably 17, 18, 19 studies that have been done. And what, what they've shown is that very consistent um, pathways are being switched on in blood in people with active tuberculosis. Now, what we therefore did was to say, well, okay, let's take an, uh, um, one of these transcriptional signatures, and we derived one of these in a very kind of standard way, very similar to how all the other uh, signatures have been derived, and see whether or not the people with subclinical disease show any signs of activity on that, um, on that transcriptional signature. So you can see here with the uh, active signature we derived, 
Um, it's probably the easiest to look at this uh, graph here, which is essentially a disease, disease risk score, which kind of sums the um, uh, the underabundant and overabundant transcripts. Uh, we had a control group with active tuberculosis that were age, sex, and CD4 matched. And you can see using the standard signature, clearly you pick up these people with active TB very uh, effectively, but the subclinical group um, is not very easily discriminable from, from those with latent. So we then asked, is there a subset within it? There might be lots of processes that occur late on in active disease, which might, might not be relevant to early disease. Are there um, a subset of these uh, um, genes or transcripts which are more relevant to uh, subclinical disease? And we identified 10% of this signature, um, which essentially discriminated those with uh, subclinical pathology from those with latent far more effectively. And what I've done here is I've split the subclinical group into those that have a fair amount of activity on the PET scan and those that had the similar abnormalities but a lower amount of um, activity and you can see those with greater amounts of metabolic activity actually had a signature which was close to active disease. We were then able to kind of interrogate what pathways were going on so what, what was it that was being enriched in this transcriptional signature um, in active disease and then in the, the subclinical group uh, and particularly in this thing focused on complement and then uh, particularly the classical complement pathway and then we went on to say well classical complement pathways are switched on or um, interact with um, antibody antigen complexes and looked at the circulating levels of antibody antigen complexes and found that they correlated very well with the expression of the classical complement pathways but also showed that um, in people with subclinical disease that the circulating levels of antibody antigen complex start to rise and I guess one of the interesting questions is what, what actually are these antibody antigen complexes and that's kind of work that we're going to be taking forward. So um, that's one approach to thinking about NC2 and I'm very pleased that Mark has uh, walked in and there's obviously another approach um, uh, that um, uh, the SATV uh, group took uh, took with their kind of uh, their colleagues and that is to follow people up um, over a period of time se sequentially take blood from them and then and those that develop disease go back to their prior blood sample to see whether or not there is a evidence of a, um, a signature of disease evolving and clearly that's very difficult to do in an HIV infected population but this was conducted in an HIV negative population and they took over 6,000 individuals followed them up for a couple of years sampling every six months 46 of them developed TB and then they were able to identify some genes which essentially kind of get switched on over the particularly the year prior to disease presentation and then they went on to uh, validate that in, in other cohorts and uh, show that essentially a, a, a group of 16 genes had 54% sensitivity and 84% specificity uh, for disease over a one year period which is really quite a significant breakthrough. Um, just to kind of tie in the work that we've been doing with the kind of work that they've been doing um, if you take some of the, sorry, I don't know what I'm pointing this at. If you take some of the, um, the genes that we were finding relevant to subclinical disease and put those into their, uh, the SATV group's um, cohort, uh, we identified that many of the genes that we, we found interesting, actually some of them are very similar to the, the genes uh, in their signature, but they also showed uh, increase in abundance the closer you got to disease and so what I suspect is is likely is that this incipient disease or you know people developing uh, having positive signatures in the six months before, before they present probably what is likely to be happening is that they have evolving subclinical disease and that's really what these uh, these transcriptional signatures are identifying what's also interesting is that these signatures um, tend to be very treatment responsive and this is a, a different group um, working on a different cohort but have shown that once you start treating people with active disease the signature kind of fades away fairly quickly within the first two weeks or two months and it might it's fairly likely that there is going to be a signature which arises over the first year to six months prior to disease and then when you start treatment kind of goes away and that that kind of treatment responsive or marker of disease pathology uh, is like to be fairly useful uh, 
uh, in the future. What do I point this at? There you go. Um, okay. Um, so these, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of interest in these tests for incipient TB, and the reason why there's been interest in them is that they are more predictive of whether someone is going to develop disease than what we have currently available, the, so the IGRAs and the, the TST. So you can see uh, really how the TST and IGRAs perform in this uh, compared to what the uh, um, SATV coral risk signature does. And this is essentially showing that um, the number needed to treat with uh, the um, coral risk signature is significantly lower than uh, uh, people with um, positive TSTs and IGRAs. But I suppose one of the questions which isn't clear is what should we now treat them with? It's, it's likely that these people have early disease rather than latent infection in the way that we classically think about it. And so is it appropriate to give these individuals just six um, months of INH or should we be using full TB treatment or should we be using uh, things like 3HP uh, as a kind of halfway compromise? And I don't think that the kind of um, clarity on that is uh, we've yet achieved, but I think we probably will over the coming years. The other thing which is, uh, I suppose, kind of slightly um, is interesting and perhaps slightly concerning as well, is that there are a lot of groups now developing these signatures, and everyone's kind of putting their hand up with their 5 gene, 3 gene, 16 gene signatures. And one of the questions is, do we really want that many different signatures? Uh, should, and, and all of these signatures are optimized to do different things. Should we really be kind of coming together and thinking about what it is that we want our signature to do and focusing on a way of um, um, achieving it rather than ending up with quite a large number of fairly similar uh, tools? So just to leave that aside and, the, and kind of move on to thinking about, I think, what will be more challenging um, is developing a t test for persistent infection, i.e. developing a test for uh, viable bacilli. I think the reason why that's going to be more challenging is that what we really don't know where, where these organisms are in, in, uh, in the latent state. But prior to reactivation, when there is no disease pathology, uh, we don't really know, one, where to find the organism, two, what the type of pathology are, apart aside from granulomas is, um, is being involved in. And because the pathology is fairly minimal, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to detect them by imaging techniques. And I think it's also unlikely that we're going to be able to use um, transcriptional profiling and, and transcript abundance as we, as we have done to try and identify um, people with viable organisms. And so we do need a slightly different approaches to think about this. And I think we probably need um, um, some kind of model systems which are probably not uh, going to be done sort of more in experimental medicine and in laboratories rather than kind of in the general public. And one, one of the models might be a BCG model, so taking attenuated um, strain of mycobacterium essentially, which we know the, bo the body is able to control and get rid of. And if we could track that and understand how uh, the numbers of organisms go down with BCG either within the skin or lungs, that might give us some insight into uh, developing markers of, of, uh, of viable bacilli and persistent infection. Clearly, we could use animal models, particularly the macaque model, which has a fairly uh, robust model for latent infection. And I think what is the vaccine community is thinking about developing at the moment a human challenge model for tuberculosis. So the focus of vaccinologists is, is, is a fairly contained model to, to assess their vaccine efficacy in phase one trials. But also in developing models like that, it gives us an opportunity to understand what is happening in the early stages of infection. And I know a number of these groups are thinking about using bacilli with particular reporters so that you can actually track them in vivo uh, particularly in animals, and it might be that that kind of approach also gives us a much greater resolution on the dynamic changes in organisms num organism numbers and uh, may allow us to develop kind of uh, biomarkers for persistent infection. And what do I think the kind of potential biomarkers will be? As I said, I, I'm not sure that the, the resolution that we'll get from whole blood transcriptional signature will be really adequate for that. But it, it might be that ultra-sensitive antigen detection might be one approach to uh, identifying persistent organisms. 
and more creative approaches thinking about dynamic changes with treatment obviously if you have organisms there and you kill them you might get a change in a signal compared to an individual that uh, doesn't have any organisms present and you treat them so that, that may be another approach to developing biomarkers why would why would a test of persistent infection be useful it would be useful because it would be the true rule out test um, if you don't have viable organisms, you can't reactivate, and therefore the, you, you know, your risk of reactivation is essentially zero. Um, it would also revert to negative with treatment and indicate sterilization. So a lot of the problems with um, in early stages of drug discovery is that we have markers of early response in terms of people becoming culture negative, et cetera, but we don't have a marker of sterility. We don't have a marker that will tell us when this is negative, the patient is not going to relapse. And I think if we had a marker of persistent infection, we could use it effectively as a surrogate marker in these kind of drug trials. And it would also allow us to personalize uh, medicine, i.e. we could stop treatment when an individual is found to be sterile. It would also revert to positive when reinfected. Now, one of the problems of working in high burden settings, and I'm sure a lot of you know, is that and particularly the adult population, everyone is TSC and IGRA positive, and you go and do household contact tracing, and it's essentially useless. Now, if we had a marker of persistent infection, it would also be a marker of reinfection in high burden settings. And I think the other kind of interesting thing is that it would also give us insight into some um, correlates of protection. So if an individual was found to be immune sensitized with a positive TST or IGRA, and was repeatedly re-exposed, either by working in a, uh, in a healthcare environment or living in the high burden setting, and they did not develop an infection at any stage, that, that, that may well be kind of demonstrate a marker of uh, protection. And just to kind of uh, run you through that uh, pictorially, at the moment we have tests like TSC and IGRA, which um, assess immune sensitization. If someone was re-exposed, they may develop uh, persistent infection, the test might, uh, test might go positive for that. When they develop disease, the disease marker or the test for incipient disease might uh, uh, become positive. When you start treatment, the first thing that will happen is that this, this test for incipient disease would revert to negative, showing that you're on the right track, that the person was responding to your therapy. The test for persistent infection would become negative, showing you a, a mark of sterility and the converse if an individual is immune sensitized and they're repeatedly re-exposed then perhaps this is kind of almost like the holy grail an individual that has an acquired immune response but is effectively controlling um, infection and not getting reinfected and give us insight as a correlate of protection so just in conclusion i think of course we need to uh, optimally implement the tools that we currently have but i think I'm not sure that they, that's going to be enough. I think they have considerable inadequacies to them, and I think we're not really going to be able to um, introduce the really bold interventions to man particularly manage this latent reservoir that we uh, want to. And this is why I think we do need new tools, particularly for incipient disease, which I think we're developing, and I think over the next five years or so, we will have some pretty decent one, uh, um, examples of this that we can start utilizing. But I think more interestingly, a test of true persistent infection, a true vi uh, test for viable organisms, will give us much better resolution of this reservoir, and also um, facilitate other areas of science, scientific endeavor, like vaccine development and drug development. So thank you very much, and I'll take some questions at this time. Um, good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm actually standing in for Sarah Murlera, who could not make it. And so, um, but I'm going to be talking on community engagement and um, particularly looking at a, a good participatory framework. Um, I think the one challenge that we've got just generally is that there's a lot of policy um, out in the world and, and um, the big challenge is really how do you implement it and I actually hope to with my presentation actually demonstrate in a very practical way how we've actually implemented um, good participatory um, uh, 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 policy um, so that that I'm based at the South African um, 
tuberculosis vaccine initiative, which is part of the University of Cape Town. Um, we house within the Health Sciences Faculty, um, particularly the Institute for Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. Um, we've got a field site that's located 110 kilometers from Cape Town. Um, in Maine, SATVI does research into TB, but with a focus areas on developing TB vaccines. Um, we've been involved with the ARIS 040 vaccine, um, as well as some diagnostics around TB, um, and then treatment through the ACTG um, network. Um, so, how do we get communities involved? Um, for us, central to um, getting communities involved is having a very robust um, engagement strategy, but part of that strategy is having a community advisory board, which is a structured way of getting communities' input into the work that you're doing, um, etc. So we've got a partnership with the Boland Research Community Advisory Board, um, it was established in 2008, um, and SATVI mainly supports the cab with infrastructure, meeting places, um, logistics, as, as well as um, administrative. The cab is autonomous, so we've, it's got its own executive committee, um, and it meets monthly. Um, when the cab members join the cab, we actually have a training program for them, um, during which we expose them to good uh, clinical practice, GCP, um, as well as clinical uh, uh, research literacy. Um, so we've also got a youth cab that meets monthly. Um, and the cab broadly consults uh, around informed consent processes, recruitment, retrenchment, re retention, as well as um, results dissemination and then advocacy. And so the picture... At the bottom over there, that's Dr. Annie Halden is uh, discussing a particular study. Um, we had a visit in 2015 where they actually took the cab to the laboratory so that people can actually see firsthand what happens to um, when they, uh, a blood product, etc. cetera, what, how, how is it stored, etc. cetera. Um, because when we started out in working in the Worcester area, the, there were rumors that existed or that came about that, you know, we buy blood products from people. Um, and then obviously wor working in, in conservative communities, those are, those, those are the issues that... You, so we regularly take our cab to our lab in Cape Town so that they can actually see um, what, what happens there. So we had a drama as well, Linky Salonga, which went throughout the area, teaching people about clinical research, um, the work that SATVI does, etc. And our cab was involved with that. Then something that we're very proud of in 2015, um, Belinda, our chairperson, presented, made a presentation at the provincial, not the provincial, the local research day which is organized by the Department of Health and where she actually int uh, she explained to people what the role of the cab is so that you have a, a buy-in from communities because you know you sometimes find that cabs function but there's not a good linkage with the community so communities don't understand what the cab is doing and that's what one important platform that we so that's our cab over there um, and two of our medical doctors um, Youth as ambassadors, I think this is something that we've been working on for some time now. Um, precisely because I think, you know, sometimes what we're dealing with is very uh, complicated for ordinary people. And so the challenge is how do you create innovative ways for people to actually um, um, uh, teach each other? And, and we've been making use of drama. so. Uh, as well as getting our youth cab to work on media projects. Um, so I, I, I know out of one of the sessions earlier on yesterday, people were asking about, you know, how do you, how do you, well, what happens at a cab meeting? Cab meeting is normally about two, meet, two hours. And I mean, if you're a lay person and you come and you have to sit with respect on if, if you have a cab member that has to sit and uh, in two hours, it's very limited. So you, you're dealing with that sort of, how do, you, how do you get ordinary people to grapple with some of these issues? 
Um, so what we've done with our youth camp is we let our youth camp meet in the mornings. So they meet between 10 and, and about 1 o'clock, and then we then work with them. We get in our clinical uh, uh, specialist. So for example, we did a consenting uh, workshop on MTBVAC uh, study. So Dr. Michelle did a session with them, and we then asked the youth camp, go and do a presentation at our general camp, which then meets at 2 o'clock. So you've then got a very good peer um, education, uh, although I must say peer education does not adequately describe it because it's actually you, young people teaching adults. And in, sometimes it's their mothers, their fathers. So it's a very innovative way of, of, of getting people to actually you know, talk about these things. Um, and so the, the, those are the sessions that we've had with our youth camp. Um, then TB... Uh, I, earlier on I had one of the people saying but you know World TV Day is one day in a year so again the challenge is how do you make it uh, uh, something that's ongoing um, in 2015 we partnered with Eris they gave us seed funding and we took the Kick TV program to four schools in the area reaching 5,000 learners then in 2016 we partnered with the Department of Education taking the program then to 23 schools and reaching 17,000 learners. Um, and this year we've partnered again with the Department of Education, where we've trained their school health workers. Um, we brought them to our site, uh, gave them a, a basic introduction to TB, um, showed them our facility so that they can also understand, you know, what happens at the clinical research site. Um, again, the idea with the 27 program is that in 2018 we want these health workers to actually go and organize World TB Day events at their own school so that you can create a bigger footprint because um, you'll, you'll know that you know these sort of events are very uh, um, it's very difficult to measure uh, content uh, people's uptake in terms of you know do they actually understand um, so the Kick TB program is a 45-minute program. It's very interactive, got a lot of songs, um, dancing. So we draw a lot on the cultural um, productions that the schools already have. So you get kids to do the dancing. Um, and then we've also got videos that we, that we show that the Kick TB has developed. And in, we, we've been also been using the ERIS educational uh, material for that. Um, so do we, okay. Then, um, for this year, we have set ourselves uh, the ambition to actually leverage libraries to raise awareness at the local levels. And this year, we've had eight sessions at four libraries um, involving art activities. So we've got an art coloring in book that we get, get kids to, to, to do. Um, our staff members and some of the cab members have also been doing story reading. Um, with TB messaging, um, and then also having interactive workshops with uh, community-based health groups, um, during which we can update them about the clinical research work that we're doing, as well as deal with any questions. You know, because you'll find that um, um, that you know there are a lot of rumours that sometimes get populated around clinical research, and that this is a very useful way to actually um, leverage of existing structures in the community. Then um, we've also, at this library engagement, we've also got a display of a graffiti wall that Dr. Michelle Tamaris did um, from a Welcome Trust Engagement Award. Um, and so the TB panels, is, there's uh, six of them, and it makes up the word BTB. So these, um, and it's a useful talking point as well. We took the display panels to the Art of Medicine, which was hosted at the Hatter Institute of, um, at, at the University of Cape Town. Um, although they specialize in heart diseases, there is a connection with um, uh, uh, TB that you get of the, of the, of the heart. Um, and at all these events, we've screened TB educational material from ERIS as well as TB Alliance, and then also the Department of Health Education. I want to emphasize that, you know, that the, uh, the story-making thing was of extremely high therapeutic value, not just for our staff, 
but for children as well, because you'll find that in ordinary communities, you know, there's not this sort of qualitative engagement that takes place between um, scientists. I mean, the, the lady over there, she's a, um, she specializes in research ethics. Now, you'll find that research ethics is not something that gets out in the community, but it was a very good experience for her to actually interact with kids, to find out where they are, at, and, and so... Um, then 2016, we also had a poster uh, design competition that we piggybacked on the Kick TB schools program. So we, we received 106 entries from the 23 schools. Um, and this year, the Department of Education have said that we must expand this competition to all the schools in the district. So we're very pleased that, you know, that a lot of the work that we're doing is actually laying the basis for expansion and also uptake by government because that is sometimes the challenge. You know, how do we get government to take up some of these programs, um, et, et cetera? So these are the kids that the winners and those are the winning entries. Um, okay. I just want to emphasize what works for us. Um, I think one of the things is because we within an academic environment, we are very clear that we've got a very good appetite for um, research and community engagement. And just the work that we've been doing since 2008 has already resulted in two master's degrees, um, one PhD and several um, published manuscripts. Um, um, uh, uh, 2015, um, Dr. Michelle presented a paper on um, some of the initiatives that we were doing at the Union Conference. Um, so, and then secondly, um, it's to have, how do you how do you leverage innovation in your organisation, but also outside of the organisation, so that you can make clinical research something that is alive and get people to actually understand it. And we, uh, since since the establishment of the organisation, we've been very fortunate in that we've had two Welcome Trust International Engagement Awards. The one of which was for Karina Sakiesa, which was a play that went throughout schools in the district. Um, and then Linky Salonga, which was a drama that we developed with the University of Cape Town Drama School. Um, and that was also uh, uh, performed at clinics in the area. So it's... A, uh, and that we wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't have the involvement of the drama school, but also the Department of Health for giving us the infrastructure where we could actually perform these, these plays. Um, just to conclude, um, community engagement is a team effort. You know, it's not something that you can just uh, let get one, it's not a one-man band. And so all our work that we're doing uh, TB talks at the schools, our staff uh, are involved, um, the study coordinators. And then just in concluding, um, we also have established a bursary program um, for school leavers in the Cape Winelands district, which covers the registration costs associated with um, the Schematis program, uh, which is basically a school bridging program which helps to prepare school leavers to actually um, enable them to uh, uh, get into varsity. Um, a month ago, there was an article in a paper in South Africa, which basically, where they basically concluded that, you know, the average youngster that enters varsity is whole sale inadequately prepared for, and that's why you've got the high uh, dropout rate at, at, at tertiary level, at least in South Africa, I don't know what the situation is elsewhere. So uh, we've come up with this initiative and we've already got four learners from the Cape Winelands district um, that is, that's on this program. Um, as we're speaking, they are preparing to go and write their matric exams um, so that they can, um, and four, all four of them have already been accepted at um, one of which is she's going to be studying psychology and, and uh, the other one also wants to study pharmacy. So, in concluding, um, I just want to thank the staff of SATVI, the, our community advisory board, um, ERIS, um, the Department of Education, as well as the Department of Health, University of Stellenbosch, and the Breda Valley um, Municipality.
So, yeah, so just in concluding, conclusion, um, I hope that I have adequately addressed the um, abstract that was um, presented to me. And yeah, so if there's any questions, I'll take any. so much. I think we'll, you'll see his work really in preparation for the meeting in Moscow. So, Mike. Yeah, thank you. And the last question is a good segue. I guess we're going from local politics to global and national politics in this talk. And um, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to the new tools groups. Um, I'm going to talk about funding for TB research. And um, if you've heard me speak on this subject before, um, you're probably used to me showing you lots of figures like the two that appear on the bottom of this slide and the overall story is quite depressing, communicating how little money goes into TB research. Um, I don't have new data to share with you yet because our annual report is going to come out in early November. So I thought I would do something a little bit different and put all of the data I'm going to present up front on this slide and then get into talking about um, opportunities before us to rectify the situation and not necessarily my vision of the opportunities, but quoting about um, opportunity, quoting ministers, government officials, activists, scientists, and hopefully these voices will spark some kind of conversation between all of us in the, in the Q&A that follows. Um, but before I get to that, I guess, um, just to sort of walk through the, the two data um, points that I wanted to show. Um, each year for the past 12 years, TAG has been conducting a global survey of funding for TB research and development. And we look at what the public, private, multilateral, philanthropic sectors are contributing to the field, and we compare this funding to what the Stop TB Partnership through the new tools groups has estimated it will take to get us to our global goals to end TB. So the first graph that you see, the purple line is showing you the um, targeted funding as called for by the Stop TB Partnership. It's an average of about $2 billion a year in funding. And the sort of magenta red line that is um, far below it on the graph is actual funding as estimated um, by reports to TAG. So you can see that total funding for TB research and development globally is sitting at about one-third of the targeted level. And rather than these two lines converging over time and getting closer together, they actually are moving farther apart. And the other thing to note is that our data, as represented here, is just nominal funding. So if you were to adjust for inflation and take into account the rising costs of biomedical research, um, it's actually quite a bit lower. We're losing purchasing power with the dollars that we have available. So it's clear that we need to increase our funding. And the funding gap exists in every category of TB research. So the second graph is showing you what the partnership has called for, for basic science, diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, operational research. Um, and then the sort of low bars within those are um, actual funding in each category for 2015, the last year for which we have data. So big funding gaps across the board. The biggest is, of course, in um, new TB drugs. Vaccines is also underfunded, as is the root of the pipeline in basic science. So that um, is sort of the framework um, that um, I want to start with. Um, and the kind of first voice, um, yes, that I wanted to present today is actually a voice um, from Mexico, from the state of Chiapas, the Zapatista movement. And the Zapatistas were on my mind because I thought it was very interesting that the community space of this conference was called Encuentro, which is the Zapatista term for encounter, an encounter with um, a moment in which people's movements, poor people, encounter forces that are larger than them, that have been forced upon them, things such as neoliberalism, things such as structural adjustment, things such as dispossession from traditional culture and land. And I don't know if the union intended to call to mind this Zapatista use of the term encuentro um, as we're meeting here in Mexico, but it brought the Zapatistas to mind, and it reminded me that they also have this really nice term that combines the Spanish word for science and conscience or awareness, conciencias. And I thought this is exactly the disposition towards science that the TB field should move forward with, a science that is animated by a kind of awareness or conscience of what people with and at risk of TB need. 
Um, so I wanted to start with the Zapatista voice. And last January, January 2017, the Zapatistas held an encuentro, an encounter for um, science for humanity. They brought scientists in different fields together in Chiapas to talk about what a human, people-centered science would look like. And one of their leaders had the following quote, which I just love, and thought would be a good question um, for us to frame um, our thinking about the opportunities ahead of us in Moscow and New York. Um, and our gaze is neither hopeful nor not hopeful. Um, our gaze is simply asking, and what about you? What are you doing? So that's the question that I want everyone in the TB research community to be asking as we prepare for these global political opportunities. And this question should motivate us because TB research is an urgent priority for all states and it is an issue of human rights. And it's possible to situate TB research, the lack of funding for it, limited progress within it, within the international human rights law framework as this um, diagram is doing here. So there's a right to benefit from scientific progress in international human rights law. It's closely related to the right to health, the right to life, the right to information. And state governments in their interpretation interpretation of what the right to scientific progress means, and as advanced by groups like TAG and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, have said that states have two obligations when it comes to research and development. They both have to develop science, in other words, support research, fund it, build capacity for it, and they have to diffuse the benefits of science, the tangible products that result from the research that we do. And that's the access or diffusion dimension of state obligations. So as we go into the next year, we also need to be thinking about our research, not just in terms of limited funding, but also limited access to the fruits of the scientific advancement that we're trying to achieve and keep this human rights framework and the question of the Zapatistas in mind. And the human rights framework has a utilitarian purpose for us because it opens the door and gives us an entry into talking about TB research in a political dimension, which as we heard from Michel Kazetschin at the opening plenary, is going to absolutely be essential if we want to capture political attention in Moscow and New York. So the next voice I want to introduce is from Lynette Mabote, TB activist with Arasa in South Africa. And she said, there can be no end to TB without an end to political indifference in this R&D agenda. So we've all heard a lot at this meeting about the ministerial conference and the UN General Assembly high level meeting on TB. And we really have to capture not only political will at these events to do something about TB research, but also a sense of real um, political action. We need to move beyond we resolve in the sort of typical language of UN declarations and resolutions to concrete actions by states at the national and international levels. So Keto Leli Ngami is a TB activist and a member of the Global TB Community Advisory Board, which advises research institutions and investigators, and he's from Nagaland, India. Reflecting on the high-level meeting in New York, he said, and the Moscow conference, these two meetings are going to be absolutely important for people like me who are committed to the cause of TB. But the apprehension is that these kinds of meetings keep on happening and lots of resolutions will be discussed. The consistency of follow-up outside the meeting rooms is what is missing. Political action is what we need to start demanding now. In other words, we need an accountability framework, which again brings us back to the human rights dimension. So to Keto's point, I tallied all of the kind of ministerial meetings that have happened on TB research since the 2009, since our last ministerial conference, which was 2009 in Beijing, a ministerial meeting of high M and XDR TB burden countries, which resulted in the Beijing call for action. We, of course, are gearing up for Moscow in 2017. In the intervening years, the BRICS ministers of health met five times in which TB research was mentioned in the communique that came out of their convenings together. So you can read through the actual text and see how TB research is discussed. Basically, it's moving from generalities in 2012, we acknowledge the importance of this, we need new tools, to in 2016 at the last Delhi meeting, really starting to get specific about things like agreeing to set up a BRICS network on TB research, the creation of a research and development consortium to tackle TB, HIV, and malaria, and the possibility of international fundraising. Critically, the recommendation from the BRICS health ministers in 2016 
finally found its way into the corresponding declaration that came out when the BRICS leaders, the heads of state, not their health ministers, met in Xiamen, China in 2017. So we can see that the political process within the BRICS countries has evolved incrementally. It's beginning to work. It's no longer just a conversation among health ministers, but heads of state have also started to recognize the importance of TB research. So to zoom out from BRICS back to the UN system for just a moment, the next quote um, or voice is that from the political declaration of the high-level meeting of the General Assembly on antimicrobial resistance, which happened in New York last September. This is a very important declaration for the TB community because TB needs to be at the center of the AMR response. It is the leading edge of the advancing AMR threat. And UN member states in signing the declaration acknowledge the need for sustained research and development for all the technologies that are important to us and including making sure that research is done in a way that promotes affordability and accessibility of products and resolves this kind of chronic lack of investment in AMR R&D. I think it's worth quoting from the declaration just once more um, because it also includes this very important statement of principles, which I think is thanks to advocacy by MSF and other civil society partners. They're saying that all research and development efforts should be needs-driven, evidence-based, and here's the part I love most, guided by principles of affordability, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and should be considered a shared responsibility. So the TAG data shows us that 60% of funding for TB research is public in its source. 60% of that public money is from the United States government. There is a lack of solidarity when it comes to funding TB research globally that declarations like this begin to chip away at. And they also acknowledge the principle of delinkage, that for diseases like TB and other antimicrobial threats, we have to delink the costs of what we put into R&D from the price and the volume of sales that we expect to get, that these kind of traditional market-driven approaches to research are not going to get us to the research we need to end TB by 2030. So parallel to the AMR declaration was another very important UN level process that we should all keep in mind and build on. It was the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's high level panel on access to medicines, which released a very inspiring report that um, I encourage everyone to read. It basically echoes and reaffirms many of the things that member states agreed on in the AMR declaration. Governments have to increase their current levels of investment. They can do this by testing and implementing new and additional models of financing. And they can even think about bigger changes to the structure of global research, including among UN member states, the negotiation of a binding R&D convention that would raise money for research, but de-link the costs of that money from the development, um, from the end prices charged for the products that are developed from it. So this is the framework that UN member states have started to put together, and it's put us in a pretty strong position. That position was strengthened by the G20 when they met in Hamburg this year. And for the first time in a G20 meeting, global health was discussed prominently. And within the declaration, TB was the only pathogen mentioned by name. So you all will remember that sort of storm that erupted when WHO left TB off the list of priority pathogens for AMR earlier this year. The advocacy that was sparked by that actually resulted in mentioning the WHO priority pathogen list and then tacking on tuberculosis as a standalone. So I think having TB named specifically is powerful, and maybe that incident, although regrettable, resulted in a good outcome. So they're calling for something specific as well. The AMR, the BRICS ministers of health have started to call for a TB research network. The G20 have called for an R&D collaboration hub, and they're meeting in Berlin to, uh, as we speak to start thinking about how that could be financed and how it could take shape. So this, of course, was reinforced, as I said earlier, when BRICS heads of state met the September in Xiamen, China. They welcomed by name, which is very unusual in this kind of declaration, the TB Research Network to be presented at the ministerial conference in Moscow, expressed their support for the high-level meeting, and committed themselves to continue working on global health issues through international forums. 
In other words, things are shaping up quite nicely for us. The opportunity is there if we take advantage of it. So the resolution part is done, right? I think there's broad agreement in terms of we have to do more on research, we have to invest. So what's up to us in Moscow and New York is not to just get a repeat resolution that echoes these things we've already put onto paper, but as Jen Ho, Deputy Director of APCASO, the AIDS uh, Asia Pacific Council of AIDS Service Organization said, we really need a real political commitment that's backed up by a real funding commitment. That's going to be the good starting point. Politicians are very good at wordsmithing, but for her and for the communities that APCASO represents, it's about having a real funding commitment by countries, strategies about how they plan on achieving their respective targets. So we need to start getting much more specific when we talk about money. And as part of um, what we can do to sort of motivate ourselves to come up with these targets is think about the way that we frame and message around research. So I wrote this slide sort of with scientists in mind, and there are um, two parts of it that I want to call out. The first is that we need to get better at talking about the cost of inaction. And for scientists, that means the projects you have that you've pitched and put into grant committees that aren't funded. You know, what some people in the scientific community have taken to calling a kind of shadow CV. You need to begin seeing your shadow CV as a political document right, as a kind of encounter with institutions that were not there to support you in the work that you needed to do, because those histories of personal rejection have implications for the field at large. What discoveries are being delayed? What's never being taken forward because funding is limited? We need to get concrete when we talk about that. And the second thing we need to do is communicate the broad benefits of TB research, not just to the fight against TB, but to medical science at large. And this is taking a page from the AIDS activist playbook. The two reports depicted here, the first was published in um, 1990 or the late 1980s um, by the federal government. It's titled, How Has Federal Research on AIDS, HIV Disease Contributed to Other Fields? So even six years before the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy, advocates for AIDS research within the US government knew that they had to justify the enormous amount of money the US was spending on AIDS by indicating what that research was giving medical science at large, even if it wasn't specific to AIDS. That has since been updated by AMFAR and other groups who wrote a document called The Broad Benefits of AIDS Research. And I think we need to work with scientists to produce a similar document for TB research. What is it that you're doing that's being picked up by others? What are you picking up from other fields? How is investing in TB research not just an investment in TB, but an investment in science writ large? Large, which is a state interest. And in this respect, I think translational science is going to be really key. The kind of translational work that was talked about at the beginning of this talk and raised by Martina in her question, but also translating um, science across communities, activists, policymakers to raise TB R&D on the political agenda. And since in TB we like to compare ourselves to the HIV field so often, I thought I would end with a quote from my boss, Mark Harrington, um, in a really excellent article reflecting on the different kinds of activism in HIV and TB. TB epidemics, where he pointed out that, like at this conference where we've had lots of talk about the things we lack, good biomarkers, other scientific tools, the assays we need, HIV was in a similar position at a certain point in time. And if there was a single pivot around which HIV drug development was accelerated, according to Mark, it was that activists, scientists, regulators, drug companies all got together and they said, we're going to start with what's inadequate, what we know is mediocre, imperfect, incomplete, and we're going to develop better things along the way. So you just have to do the work, and we have to communicate that to governments. We may not be ready to have a biomarker-based TB test for all kinds of subclinical and incipient disease now, but there's work that we can do to get there and that's the kind of opportunity that needs to be communicated. So on that note, I'll just leave you with a preview of our report, which is going to come out November 8th, give you an update on the TB funding situation. Um, we, with permission, um, borrowed our cover from an old edition of The Magic Mountain, which some of you may know Thomas Mann set at a TB sanitarium in Davos, Switzerland, which today hosts the World Economic Forum. So it's good to think about TB research in the context of Mann's novel, going from Davos as the place where TB was treated, perhaps in greatest numbers at a certain point in European history, to the place where heads of state and ministers of finance convene annually to talk about what is a priority for their spending. So with that, I'll close, and thanks 
um, very much. <laughs>